Let's cover post-labor economics in five minutes or so. Let's dive right in. So first and foremost, post-labor economics is what we sometimes call the great decoupling. Now, let me just read it to you real quick. Post-labor economics acknowledges the irreversible decoupling of GDP growth from wage employment and builds institutions that convert the resulting productivity surplus into broad property-based income streams, thereby freeing people from involuntary tedious labor while safeguarding shared prosperity. Now, that is a lot of words to basically say automation is going to take all of our jobs. Moving on. The primary mechanism that we're looking at here is what's called labor substitution. And basically, labor substitution means that work goes from humans to machines when the machines are better, faster, cheaper, and safer. This has been historically true for all of human history and continues to be true and is only accelerating with artificial intelligence and robotics, which are just the next wave of automation. Automation is nothing new. It's been around for literally centuries. It's only become more and more sophisticated. And by the way, as automation has become more sophisticated, more labor substitution has occurred. Now, this leads to what we call the economic agency paradox, which is best summarized in this meme that I found on Reddit. Uh, so, step one, we replace 90% of our workforce with AI. Our operating costs are now the lowest they've ever been. And then every other company does the same thing, and no, no one is buying our products since they're all jobless. So that's kind of the automation, That sorry, the economic agency paradox in a nutshell. Next is aggregate demand or household income. So if everyone loses their job, you have to look at where does income come from. First, there's wages, then there's property, and then there's transfers. Right now, 60 to 80 percent of income nationally, on average, comes from wages, but that's declining slowly. The rest comes from property, which is stocks, bonds, rental properties, those sorts of things, real estate, and then the and then uh, also transfers. So this is the the ratio nationally in America is about 60 percent, 20 percent, and 20 percent. And transfers include things like Medicare, Social Security, SNAP, and those uh, those sorts of things. Basically, stuff that is paid for directly from taxes. Uh, now, if then we're losing wages, then we need to increase the amount of income we have coming from property and transfers. Now, if you're entirely dependent upon transfers, that means you're entirely dependent upon uh, the government, which means that you're a welfare state or a client state, which is not good because then all of your eggs are in one basket and you don't have any control over your future. And by the way, if you know the other party gets elected next time and they say we're going to cut your, tr your, your we're going to cut your uh, UBI or whatever then you're up the creek without a paddle. So the one of the keystone principles of post-labor economics is that we need a distributed property-based future. That means uh, property and dividends. So moving on. When we talk about a property-based income stream, we're talking about uh, several different sources. So number one, we do want some UBI to provide a floor. Um, so that is going to be government-based, government, uh, government based, uh, tax based uh, you know, distributions. Next is going to be wealth funds. So wealth funds include sovereign wealth funds at the national level, but also urban wealth funds um, and community investment trusts and those sorts of things. So these are often run either by the government or by public-private partnerships. Um, think of them like endowments. So you'll create endowment funds that basically just by virtue of being a citizen of a particular region, you get a check in the mail every month or every quarter or every year. The next level above that is going to be private collective property. So this is stuff that you own in common, um, either through credit unions or DAOs or those sorts of things, um, which are also likewise going to be paying rent. So when you say, like, well, what do you mean? We could mean data centers. We could mean robots. We could mean any kinds of resources, solar farms, fusion reactors, quantum computers, any kind of property that can be owned. And instead of buying it individually or buying shares, you put your money and your resources together and you own it collectively. Next is private wealth. So private wealth is basically what you have today. Stocks, bonds, shares, companies, those sorts of things, real estate, land. None of that really changes. And then finally, the last uh, source of revenue is going to be uh, residual wages. So basically, we're kind of right now anticipating that about 20% of wages might, might stick around. Um, time will tell. It could be more, could be less. But right now, we're trending towards that direction. Next. There are four pillars of civic society. So when you think about, you know, what is the social contract? The social contract is generally between the governed and the governors. So the, the people in the state. However, 
Uh, the social equilibrium today is maintained by four primary stakeholders, which is the, we the people, so civilians, citizens, the state, which is the government, which ostensibly is built for and by us and should serve us, but more and more states are becoming less about the people and more about serving businesses and banks. Now, we're not going to build a society that gets rid of businesses and banks anytime soon. It's possible in the long run, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. So what we really need is to rebalance uh, the, the balance of power that happens here if we lose wage power and labor power. So when we talk about economic agency, there are three primary pillars of power that we have. Number one, above all, is labor rights. Labor basically is the one thing that we have intrinsic control over until machines take away our ability to work and demand uh, money for that labor. Because the ability to withhold labor is, is a, one of the fundamental levers of power that we have, which then guarantees property rights and democratic rights. If we lose labor rights, which we are losing, um, not only are we not only are labor rights eroding under the neoliberal regime, they will erode further um, as automation, AI, and robotics further encroach upon one of the intrinsic levers of power that we have as civilians, which then means that our property rights and democratic rights will also erode. This is far and away the larger problem other than the economy. It's mu it's fundamentally about power. If we lose power, we lose everything. So how do we fix this problem? What we need is we need a replacement pillar. So that becomes algorithmic rights. Um, in this new paradigm, we replace labor rights with algorithmic rights in, uh, in, this, in this new paradigm, which then shores up property rights and democratic rights. Data sovereignty, algorithmic auditability, participatory algorithmic governance, and algorithmic dividend and liability. This is all based upon technologies like blockchain, decentralized autonomous organizations, cryptocurrency, central banking, uh, digital currencies, um, digital identity wallets, and those sorts of things. We will need. We are already building this infrastructure, but it is not yet e not ready yet. Sorry, um, but with that being said, blockchain is central to this future. There are some of the technological affordances of blockchain make it the ideal baseline technology for this new social contract. Number one, it's intrinsically democratic. Number two, it's intrinsically decentralized. Number three, it's unstoppable. You can't shut it down. And number four, it's permissionless. You don't need the government's permission to build a blockchain. So with all that being said, thank you for watching. You have now learned about post-labor economics in about five minutes. Cheers.